good evening, good evening, good evening, and uh, welcome to all attendees out there. Um, you have joined a webinar on the A120 Little Haddon Bypass, the archaeological discoveries. Uh, my name is Rob Sutton, I'm Director of Heritage Consultancy at Cotswold Archaeology, and I've been working on the archaeology of this project for uh, about two and a half years now. Um, and this evening, we're going to hear from my colleague, Joe Barker, about the archaeological discoveries. Um, just before we uh, listen to Joe and have a look at some of the fantastic discoveries we found on site, I'm um, just going to do a little bit of housekeeping to make sure we're up to speed on how the day this evening is going to go. Um, we've got two functions to communicate with uh, myself, Joe, and the panel of experts who will join the Q&A at the end of the lecture. Uh, the first one is the chat box, and um, I'd like to direct you all to post something over the next couple of minutes just to say your name, where you're from, where you're listening in from. Um, we have about 200 attendees we're hoping for this evening. Uh, 250 tickets have been sold yeah, about where you're listening in from. Um, during the I've just had a hello from Gloucestershire. That's a good start. I wonder how far we can get further afield. I know on previous webinars, we had people listening from all corners of the world. Um, the chat box is going to be available for, uh, for the next few minutes, just to listen in to where you're all calling in from. Um, we also have a Q&A box as well. And, and we'd like you to post questions that we might be able to answer live um, during the lecture. Um, the questions are only available and visible to you and to us, the panellists. Uh, and me and Joe as well. Um, uh, and it may well be that we collate some of those questions and bring them into the Q&A at the end. So we're going to be hearing from Joe. Joe's lecture takes about 45, 50 minutes. So it does give us a nice 20 minutes at the end, 25 minutes at the end, wrapping up about quarter past eight. So just like to say a few thank yous at the beginning rather than at the end, which I know is traditional. But the reason for that is just to provide a little bit of context. And the context is that archaeological projects like the one that Joe's going to talk about require a lot of collaborations. From the very early stages of this project, five, six years ago, with a, a, an old friend of mine, an old university buddy, Jim Kite, who works at Arab Consultants, working with the team over at um, Hearts Council, Alison Tinnerswood and her team, designing and putting together the proposals that eventually turned into the project that we worked on. And then when Graham won the contract to build the flood alleviation scheme and bypass, and we worked alongside them to design the archaeological works programme to make sure that all of the intricacies of a construction project wouldn't impact the way in which we were doing our work and our work wouldn't impact on their work. So it's a big thank you to Seamus McLaughlin, Alan Bray, and his team over at Graham's. Um, one little point regarding um, the way in which the evening's going to work, which I just forgot in my introduction, which is at the end of the webinar, um, you'll get a little pop-up for a, a Q&A, after the Q&A, excuse me, a little pop-up with some questions. It'll take you about two or three minutes, just get some feedback on how you thought the session went. Now, because of technical issues, the little presentation I was going to do as an introduction has failed this evening, these things happen. So to be honest, you didn't really want to hear from much from me, and I really am keen to pass over to Jo so we can hear what she has to say. So without further ado, <laughs> I'll ask Jo to step in, and I'll move myself out of the way. Thanks, Jo. Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, as Rob said, I'm going to be talking for the next 45 minutes about the discoveries that we made along the A120 bypass around Little Haddam and the associated flood alleviation scheme. So the main excavation um, ran between the summers of 2019 to 2020, but inevitably there was a lot of work beforehand and we're still working through the, the fines and pulling everything together now. Um, the, the specialists are busy working on the different assemblages, the animal bone and the pottery, and eventually we will compile all of that into a monograph. So for, for those of you who don't know the area too well, um, I've just popped this map in so you can, you can see where we are. But um, this is the main town, Bishop Stortford, which is just on the west side of the M11. And this dotted line just gives you a rough idea of where the, the bypass ran. So Little Haddam's here and the bypass starts just to the west of it 
avoiding the busy crossroads. And then it feeds back into the current course of the A120 just to the west of Bishop Stortford. And you can see that the course of the road goes through undeveloped field, uh, farmland. And for that reason, we needed to, there was a, a long process before we actually put any spades in the ground to try and work out what the potential of the area was, um, where we should focus any um, you know, archeological investigations. Um, the, the general area is very rural, so there hasn't been much developer-led archaeology, uh, archaeological investigations in the area. Um, in, in recent years, there's been a lot more around Bishop Stortford, um, but that they're relatively recent, so the findings from those sites are, are still are still being compiled as well. So the initial stage involved. Um, looking at the historic environment record, looking at old maps, and that would give us an idea of what has been found in the area. And this is a, a very um, general idea on this plan of what has been found so far. And the, the red stars show where there's where we found ditches with a bit of Roman pottery in, or there's um, a record of a Roman uh, tile kiln at Haddam, uh, Haddam Hall. And there's this kind of information that helps us work out whether there is potential. Um, one of the most significant um, things about Little Haddam and Much Haddam is the Roman pottery industry that we, we've known about. Well, it, it was excavated at Bromley Hall Farm between the 50s and 60s. So we've, but I think we've discovered um, kilns before that point. So the, um, the industry started I think in the late first century, and it was mainly local distribution, but it really got going at the, the later third century, and we find it, we find the distribution is much wider, and you find Haddam Ware in Colchester as well. Um, one of the stages, st early stages of evaluation is geophysical survey, which I'm sure you're all aware of now, um, and this is the southwestern corridor of the road scheme and some of the watching brief areas and this just gives you an idea of the the areas we covered and we did quite a wide swathe so that we at that early stage we could accommodate any changes in the layout of the road um, we had mixed results from the geophysics and it's usually down to the geology but this site which is our, our site three which i will show you the location of in a bit was really really stunning so we we picked up this enclosure and you can just see it poking out to the north of the road corridor, which is defined by the red lines. It runs through the road corridor and down below. And we had a hint of a roundhouse here and a, another enclosure here. And when we actually stripped the site, we did find the ditches. So you can just see the blue and the blue of the ditch and the roundhouse there. So all this information we pulled together and allowed us to identify four main uh, sites that we would focus on. And these are the areas of the densest archeology. span So that's site one, site two, three, and four. But inevitably there, there would be archeological archeo there, be features that would appear in between, which miss the trial trenches, miss the geophysics. So, we also had 188 watching brief sites, which you can see here, which would pick up any of those stray features and give us a much better idea of, of you know, what archeology span lay in the corridor. It's also really important for early prehistoric where the societies were mobile and often the, the evidence of settlement is very vague. And <laughs> at least with this, this, this sort of way of sampling the site, you can pick up those stray features. So the entire, over the entire site, we collected 10,000 shards of pottery, the majority coming from our, our um, southwesternmost site, site one, which I'll show you in a moment. 693 metal items, which included 72 Roman coins, 40, gra 40 kilograms of animal bone, and interestingly, 18 cremation burials and five inhumation burials. And that might not seem much, but quite often you find you can strip a huge area and not find any evidence of the people, no burials. But on this one, 
we actually found a lot. So that was really nice to have. And this is one of our stamp, well, our only stamped piece of Samian, which you can just see the stamp mark there. And we've been able to identify that as um, a South Gaulish Samian from Le Graffesson, which is south of France. And we've been able to find out that the potter is Patrice one hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. And he was working between 70 and 100 AD. So that's a really lovely piece to find. So the earliest evidence of, of human occupation in the road corridor and in one of our watching brief areas was actually dated to the early Neolithic. But um, initially we, th we thought it would be roughly the Mesolithic to early ne Neolithic based on some work flints that we found. But we have been able to refine the date to the early Neolithic by radiocarbon dating. Most of the, these stars show you where we found the stuff. So you can see how important it is to have the watching brief areas because one of the pits was picked up here. We probably wouldn't have found it otherwise. And another one was found just to the west of site three. Um, and these are mainly, I think site one had three pits, but the rest were one or two, maybe a pit and a tree throw or just an isolated pit. So it's really hard to, to find this evidence. So this is one of our pits and you can get an idea of, of why it's sometimes easy to miss them. I mean, they, they do range in depth. Um, this pit um, contained flint tempered pottery. It contained an assemblage of hazelnut and apple pip type, uh, apple type pips, um, which are typical of an early prehistoric date. So having been able to radiocarbon date it and get an early Neolithic date, it's been really, really great. So this is um, a photo of the pottery that we found and you can see it's very fragmented. It's very difficult to date, but certain attributes are consistent with the carinated bowl series. So that's early Neolithic. So that, that tallies with the, the radiocarbon date. So that's brilliant. So the first firm evidence for settlement was during the middle to late Bronze Age. And we found that in two locations, one at site one and one at site two. And they were really, really significant because they, they more or less mirrored each other. So it was great to have two, two reasonable uh, middle Bronze Age sites. So site one, which was at the southwestern end of the road corridor, that had, we found a semicircular ring of post holes when I mean, the evidence is is reasonably vague but you can see the post holes and there's a hint of a little porch going off so a southwest a northwest facing entrance but what's really great about this site is the number of cremation burials that we we had so you can see there just here all the other dots are uh, just pits all the cremation burials were unearned um, there's just one shed of pottery, early prehistoric pottery was found in this cremation. Um, so it could be, it could be represent the remains of a truncated um, cremation vessel, but yeah, this one shed of pottery. Um, the, we found between the, the graves contain between 60 and 70, 700 grams of cremated bones. So there was a real variation and it didn't seem to tally with the shallow shallowness of the feature. So the, what, the most shallow burial contained the largest amount of cremated bone. So it suggests that they're possibly, the people were collecting a token um, assemblage of bone from the pyre and depositing that. Or it could be that they were just placing it in a, a different, you know, higher up in the grave. So it was truncated. Um, one of the graves, which is this one, this one contained an unusually large amount of bark fragments, which we know wouldn't have been used as fuel. So we have surmised that the, the, the individual on the pyre was, um, sorry, uh, that a container was placed on the individual on the pyre and the bark from that, from that container was buried in the grave. There are a few examples of this, but we're still looking into it. 
this is an example of one of our um, middle late Bronze Age cremation burials. So you can see there's not much actually on top, but it's all down in the base of the burial. So this is our other middle to late Bronze Age settlement, which was at site two. And you can see once again, we have these circular sort of or semi-circular rings of post holes. This is the most complete one, which is really nice. And you can see it's, <laughs> it's um, arranged in pairs of post holes, which I haven't seen before. That's really interesting. And again, we have two cremation burials further down here. One interesting point is that a pit just down here, which is on the same alignment as the cremation burials, that contained an associated group of cattle carpels. And you often find this with, with these early cremation burials that you'll find a, a pit close by which will have an, a collection, an assemblage of associated animal bones. And it seems significant, the fact that they're there near the cremation burial. So maybe it's some, some form of offering rather than placing it in the grave, they place it in a pit nearby. Or maybe a way of commemorating the dead returning at a later date and placing an offering in a pit. So this is um, a closer view of one of our post hole buildings. And I've just added the dots just so you can see. It's, it's sort of at a funny angle, this photo. You can, see, you can see the pairs anyway. And I've added this example. This is, these roundhouses were found on the stands, during the Stansted excavation um, over to the uh, east. And these post hole buildings are of the same date. And you can see they also had porches. But what's interesting is these ones were all associated with an outer ditch. And it's possible that ours were also, also had a ditch, but it, it hasn't survived. So following the, there, were, there was very little um, evidence of occupation after the late Bronze Age, but from the Middle Iron Age, we get this um, enclosure in site three, which is down here. This is the one I showed you earlier. So we have a roundhouse, as we, we thought, and an enclosure with a post-built structure in the middle. Um, interestingly, this roundhouse is defined just by ditch and no post holes. And this was the same at Stansted Airport as well. They, all their sort of Iron Age roundhouses didn't seem to have the same post ring inside. So it seems rather than it being a survival, a product of survival, it's actually perhaps a different construction technique used. So I've just popped that slide on again, just so you can see the geophysics because it's so nice. And um, during the excavation, we also had, um, we flew a drone over to get some photos, which is always so, so good to have. So you can just see where the red, the red square is. You can just see our roundhouse there. And this is um, a view of the enclosure, which I'll just go back to uh, this enclosure here with our post-built structure inside which just disappeared underneath the limit of excavation. So I'll just stay with um, site three for, for a little bit longer. We, following the Middle Iron Age, there was a brief bit of activity in the late Iron Age going into the early Iron Age. And you can just see the blue ditches. There's not much, um, and they, they probably just represent a couple of fields. Um, but activity increases in the Roman period. And this is what these orange and green ditches show you. So the orange ditches are the early Roman and the green ditches are the later Roman. Um, you can see in the early Roman period, a trackway was established, which runs across the middle, the middle Iron Age enclosure, which is the gray features. And there's just hints. It's a bit of a tangle of features, but there's just hints of an enclosure on this side of the trackway and possibly on this side. But by the mid to late Roman period, 
the another enclosure is dug over the trackway blocking it and we have this circular enclosure up here as well as established. We had very little pottery from this site um, under 200 sherds which is under one and a half kilograms so it seems that it's very much just an enclosure system no evidence of, of structures. But what was interesting is the circular enclosure. Um, generally, you, when you do find circular enclosures on Roman farmsteads, they're quite often um, enclosing an area of activity, uh, such as crop processing and things like that. And this is a, a view of it. You just see it coming around here. And this, this enclosure had very little going on inside, um, but it had a little square pit here, which you might just see, which was only about 20 centimetres deep and was filled with sort of crushed chalk material. So we're not quite sure what that was, but it, it might, it may have been some form of surface that they had put in there, perhaps involved in crop processing, but not sure. And you can see here a darker deposit and the this is the entrance to the enclosure and it seems that they were dumping sort of burnt charred plant material there as well but otherwise we don't really know what the enclosure is for um, and we did get most of it so <laughs> still looking into that um, but one of the nice finds we got was from that circular enclosure and there it's this shale bracelet just a fragment of it um, with a ring and dot design. Uh, this is a third to fourth century, has a third to fourth century date, and generally shale is in this period is from the Kimmeridge, is from Kimmeridge in southeast Dorset. So it's traveled a little way. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll talk to you about uh, site one, which is the southwestern end of the bypass. And this was the most fruitful of the sites. Uh, during the late, we didn't have any middle um, Iron Age activity in this area. So the last time I talked to you about this site was the to show you the middle to late Iron Age, middle to late Bronze Age settlement with all the cremations. So there was a break. And then in the late Iron Age to early Roman period, they dug this ditch. You can just see the red, which is the earliest phase of this enclosure. And then another enclosure underneath. And what's also nice is if you can just make out the red dots, they are three cremation burials. So late Iron Age to early Roman cremation burials. And one of them was positioned right next to one of our middle to late Bronze Age cremation burials. And we've had two radiocarbon dates from that burial. So we definitely know it is, it is middle Bronze Age. So this is one of our our late Iron Age cremations. And you can see there's several vessels in the, in the burial, in the grave. So you have the cremation urn, which contains all the cremated bone, and then two ancillary vessels either side. And that's a close up, so you can see all the bone in it. And then this was our only unearned cremation from the late Iron Age cemetery. Um, but the bone was covered by this early Roman uh, fine greyware platter. And that's it, cleaned up and photographed. So yeah, so that, that dates to 50 to 70 AD. So this plan shows you the Roman activity in, on site one. So again, like the other site, the orange is the early Roman and the green is the late Roman. And you can see there's a lot more going on you know, since the late Iron Age, uh, late Iron Age, early Roman. Um, one of the main things being this cemetery down here, which is where we have our late Iron Age cremation burials. So this is a, a zoomed in, uh, slide so you can see the black stars are our late iron age early roman burials we have the blue one here which is our middle to late bronze age one and the orange stars are the new early roman cremation burials and the six of them um, and they're all earned and they're 
nicely spread out. Um, they contain a lot more um, cremated bone than, than the sort of middle to late Bronze Age ones. And I assume that's because they're in vessels, so they're protected, so you, you get more bone surviving. And there's also two inhumation burials up here. So the cemetery is being reused. So it's the same area as the late Bronze Age, the middle to late Bronze Age cremation burials, the late Iron Age cremation burials, and now the same area is being used in the early Roman period. And this is an example of one of them. So you can see it's, it is quite similar to the late Iron Age um, cremation I showed you previously. It has you know, one cremation urn and several ancillary vessels as well. And this is one of the inhumation burials. They were both, they were both extended and, and laid on their backs. And um, this is a young adult male. And it's buried with a vessel just here, which I have a close up of. Oh. There. And this is the lower half of a Haddonware flagon. So it's a nice, it's a local, locally produced vessel, which is really nice. And this is the other individual and older adult male. And he was found with an iron brooch just on his shoulder here um, of early to mid first century date. So now I'm moving on to the late Iron Age, the late Roman period. And you can see that the, the activity has increased. There's um, a, lot more, a lot more ditches, so an increase, a sort of um, expanded field or enclosure system. And the main area of activity, which is here, is now enclosed by this ditch, which comes down here and down here. And we know from the geophysical survey that, actually, that it, the ditches do continue. And it's actually trapezoidal, so it's not rectangular as you, you might think based on what you can see. Um, we have this large hollow here, which is a feature I'll talk about in a bit. And again, this, this same enclosure, which was dug in the late Iron Age, early Roman period, and is still, still open now in the late Roman period, although we think it was backfilled probably, well, it was backfilled during this period because it's full of late Roman pottery so and the fact that you have ditches inside suggests it, it wasn't used it was more just a, a depression by this stage and I've also included on this slide some of the finds so you can see that we we've had the odd coin out of a ditch there's an odd coin there and there and we've had a few um, dog skeletons which were sort of concentrated in this area of the settlement so there's one I've, I've labelled there, partial dog skeleton and a horse skull. So there's some, a focus there for animal burial. And the other point of interest is this area here, which is a crop processing area where we have a dryer and a stone surface. And I will talk about those in a minute. Um, I added this in so you can see one of our nice slides. Um, finds this is a, a late Roman jet bead um, it's double pierced and they think it probably would have been a, tong a pendant or a toggle rather than a bead and that was found in this ditch here and at, at this point um, jet was coming from the Yorkshire coast near Whitby so again it's come from from a long way so I'll focus on our cemetery which is now being added, has been added to again. So you'll see there's one, the green is the mid to late Roman. So the green is a new cremation burial. And then we had two new inhumations up here. So there's a lot of burial, a lot of burials in this area now. And this one here, you can see has been buried in the top of, of a, early Roman ditch. So we can assume that these ditches had almost infilled by this period, although may have survived perhaps as a hedge line because it's tantalizing to think that this, this part of the cemetery was still enclosed by something. This is the inhumation that was, that was buried in the ditch, as I've just spoken about, older adult female. She has her arm 
up behind her head and on her hand was an iron ring. We've lost her right leg, unfortunately. And this is the other inhumation, which you can see the shallow is, the grave is far shallower, but we were still able to recover um, 48 hobnails from this foot, which indicates that it was buried with Roman style footwear. And there's a slide giving you an idea of what it may have looked like. And you can buy this on Amazon if you'd like. So to summarize the burials, um, I've added this slide so you can see you can see the location of all our middle to late Bronze Age burials. And you can, you can see the black are the late Iron Age, the orange are the early and the green are the mid to late. So they're all, most of them are clustered in this area and obviously with a few up here. And what's interesting is that they're not too far from this hollow, which has raised quite a few questions for us. And um, because this hollow has produced 36 Roman coins with a very narrow date range. And I'll show you, that's an aerial photograph so you can, of the hollow there, so you can see it's sizable. So we, looking at the plant remains, um, well, there aren't any plant remains and we don't think it was a pond. So at the moment we're calling, a hollow, calling it a hollow but this, this is the pond during excavation and all the orange flags um, are locations of um, finds. So to summarise, there were 30 Roman coins um, dated between 330 and 340 AD. And we had hobnails, nails, iron, an iron ring, a fragment of iron knife and 14 and a half kilograms of pottery. And this is one of the coins that we recovered, just as an example. So as I said, the interesting thing about the coin assemblage is the narrow date range and the fact that we haven't really had that many coins from elsewhere in this farmstead. And to have such a concentration suggests that either it's a hoard or that people were continually throwing the coins in, you know, over a couple of decades. Um, also interesting is the fact that the assemblage contained two rare coins, one from the Constantinople mint and one from a mint in Arles in southern France. And so we've been wondering what this hollow is. Um, and one suggestion is that perhaps it could be it could be the remains of a barrow. And this might explain why we have all the uh, middle to late Bronze Age cremation burials there. And then, you know, the Roman the Roman burials, and but also all these artifacts in the hollow. But again, the evidence, <laughs> there's not much evidence with the hollow, it's very difficult to interpret. So we are still looking for, for other examples and, and trying to have a look through all the data and make a decision. So our crop processing area was our other really interesting find. So it was on the south, uh, the western side of the farmstead in site one, and it was slightly downhill and not too far from a watercourse, so it'd be ideal perhaps for a, for a crop processing. And this is the oven here, so I'll show you some better photos in a minute, but it's um, a tuning fork type oven, so it has two, a sort of a, a chamber here, coming around another chamber there in a sort of tuning forks pattern. And this is the stoke hole, this end. And there was also a stone surface just to the southeast of it, which I will come on to in a bit. And this drying oven was enclosed by these ditches, which is often the case. This is the drying oven when it was first stripped. So you can hardly see anything. There's just traces of the limestone on the surface. And gradually our fantastic archeologists worked on it and started revealing what was underneath. So you can see this is the stoke hole again. And um, this guy is just digging out one of the, the uh, flues. 
And here we are, with it almost excavated. So here's an aerial photograph. So you can, you can see the layout and you can see the tuning fork shape that I, I, I mentioned and the, the, the flue coming out into the stoke hole and the fire pit. So the stoke hole would, is never usually, um, it is usually quite amorphous in shape because through the constant raking out and that's exactly what we have here. What's also interesting is that we had these, these um, rich assemblages of charred grain here and here, um, which suggests that they had a fire and the crop caught fire. And we think perhaps that that happened at the end of it. We think it happened just after, just before it was abandoned. So it marked the end of the use of it. But what is interesting is that you can also see a very dark deposit in the flue and they've put a line of um, clay and limestone across the entrance of the flue and I think that perhaps they were having trouble they were having trouble with the heat early on and trying to regulate it and this little barrier is probably was probably put in as a baffle to control the heat into the the um, oven. And this is an image of some of the charred grain that we had. It was very rich. So this is a close up of the flue and you can just see the, the baffle that went across there. And there's also deposits of pottery in the, in the sort of, well, in the flue and near the, the stoke hole, the fire pit end. And I think this may be just to protect, protect the floor of it because through constant raking out, rakings, you know, you would, you would um, end up scouring quite a lot of the base. So perhaps the, by putting pottery in there, it's heat proof and, and it would just sort of protect the floor a bit. And there's um, a lovely dump of pottery here, which I guess was their store ready to, to keep lining the, the base of the flue. And here's another picture of a drying oven. <laughs> it's really beautiful. But you can see the, um, the burning in the flue and the stoke hole end. And you can also see quite clearly the, the, deposit, the burnt deposits up in the chambers. So we think the drying ovens would have been inside a structure or would have had something over the top of them. Um, they're usually Sunk, slightly sunken so that the floor level um, is at ground level. Um, this is a reconstruction that Peter Reynolds did at Butzer. And um, you can just see, I think that's the stoke hole there. Uh, we don't always get evidence for buildings and we didn't in this, in this instance, but you sometimes find post holes. So you, you, can, you can assume that they're the remains of a, a superstructure. But we didn't find anything. We didn't find any wattle or daub. Um, inside the sort of demolition layer of the in the corn dryer. So we found a stone surface just to the southeast of the corn dryer. It was very scrappy. I'll show you. Very scrappy. Apologies for the the dark slide. Um, yes, it's, it it didn't have much shape to it and it seems to have two components. So whether or not the crushed chalk um, originally um, extended over these sort of cobbles, we're not sure. But we've tentatively interpreted it as a possible threshing floor. Um, we quite often find stone surfaces adjacent to corn dryers in this region. Um, and that's what we interpret them as. Um, I don't think we've, we have another, I don't think generally we have a, a, another explanation for them. Um, but these are, are two examples from the region where you can see there's a corn dryer and a threshing floor and exactly the same here. These are far nicer examples, far more complete examples um, than our one. But um, we're tentatively um, interpreting it as a threshing floor, possible threshing floor. So 
the other interesting thing about this site, um, again, is returning to this enclosure. And up here in the ditch, we found a really rich assemblage of crop processing waste, um, and also waste, we think, from the malting process. So there was 2,264 2, identified items just from this little ditch, from this segment of ditch. I'll show you a photo and you can see how rich it is. And it looks like it's been tipped in. So um, this dark deposit represents um, several deposits that have been thrown in from this side. And we think it's, it's likely, based on the composition of that charred plant assemblage, that there may have been another drying oven up here um, and one that was used um, for malting as well, not just for drying. And we took monolith samples from that. So we've been able to, to do full analysis on the, on the remains. And, and that's it. And I'm just left to say thank you to everyone that has worked on this project and all the archeologists who are out there in all the different weathers and, and produce such lovely results. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, about a year ago, I did a presentation on, on the finds to a little select audience. Um, and uh, at, at the time, there were some certain assumptions we were making because we hadn't had an opportunity to do the detailed studies, which we've done over the last 12 months. So it's great to hear fresh updates and fresh interpretations of some of those things too. Um, and from an expert like you talking on the subject, as opposed to an almost expert like me last time around. Um, so there's an opportunity now um, for us to pick up on some of the questions that have been coming in. I've, I've, we've just spotted a few coming in on the chat. It's still really useful for us if you're collecting the questions into the Q&A box so we can bring them together and um, bring some of those questions to the panel too. Um, I'm just going to ask our panel members to uh, turn their cameras on as well so we can see them all. Um, I won't be introducing them um, uh, specifically at this point, but as particular questions come in to us, there's an opportunity for them to introduce themselves, actually. I will just uh, say good evening to Philippa, Sarah, Sharon, and Ed. Hello, um, colleagues present and past as well. Um, so some of the questions we had coming in were just uh, a little bit about some of the logistics of the, the project. So uh, a question came in uh, from, from Jan um, regarding the um, how we determined some of the watching brief areas. In effect, the watching brief areas were archaeologists monitoring whether they were going to be doing some ground disturbing works. So there might have been some topsoil stripping in other areas of the uh, proposed new bypass, or some top stripping, top soil stripping areas in some of the areas for the flood relief schemes as well. Um, one of the images that uh, that Joe shared included an area to the south away from the main line of the road. That was where some of those flood relief works were going on. And that's where we found some archaeology too. Um, a couple of the other questions were, um, Joe, could you add some dates to some of the periods that you were referring to? Um, and um, <laughs> what I'll probably do, and I'd be happy for anybody to correct me, and I'm sure Ed will, if he's available. Um, I went, when, when Joe was talking about some of the uh, later Neolithic stuff, um, you were talking about about 6,000, sorry, early Neolithic, <laughs> excuse me, talking about about 6,000 years ago. Um, Middle Bronze Age, you were referring to some of the uh, burials as well, which were about 3,500 years ago. Um, late Iron Age, uh, about 2,000 years ago, just before the Roman period, I was principally talking about about 43 to about 410 AD. And my colleagues are correcting me in any of those dates. So that's a good start. I've got, I'm getting a nods and thumbs up from that. That's a good start. Thank you. Um, a couple of the other questions that came in as well um, were about the survival of buried archaeological remains. So I'll just take this one if that's all right. Um, we've got about 40 centimetres, about 400 millimetres of plough soil and topsoil that buried most of the archaeology that Joe's been talking about this evening. And it's that soil that's regularly and seasonally turned over by the plough when you've got agricultural fields up where this scheme was. So below that is where we've got the remains of the former cut 
features like ditches and pits and some of the cremation burials. And it's the artifacts and the finds within those that we discover. So what we're really finding is we're finding the bottom part of what might have been a larger feature. So a deep ditch that would have come from the top of the land, maybe about a metre deep. The top 400 or so millimetres, 40 centimetres of that, has been lost and churned up. So some of the cremation burials where you saw bits of the pot have been broken off, the plough had just got into the top of it and just started to damage some of those areas. Um, and it's what survived below that that we've been able to pick up during our excavations. Sometimes features are buried, buried much more shallowly and all we pick up is just the ghost elements, just the last surviving bits of the bottom of a much more shallow feature. So when Joe made reference to the uh, the ditches or the eaves drip gullies that surrounded some of the prehistoric roundhouse settlements, roundhouses, excuse me, um, if they were buried quite shallowly and cut quite shallowly, we might have lost them completely, which is why we weren't picking up on. And if um, Sarah, good to bring you in here. Um, we had a, a question just asking a bit more about the, the hollow and about whether we had any interest in um, eco uh, and environmental evidence that come from that. Um, Sarah, whilst well, it does the environmental work for Cotswold, I looked at quite a lot of the samples from the hollow um, and the top fills had a lot of crop processing waste and things that should have been dumped material from the activities that was around the area, but not associated with the use of the hollow itself. We looked hard to see if there was any waterlogged remains or anything in that. There's nothing to suggest it was a it was used as a, a pond or anything like that. And the detailed um, examination of the sediments by our geoarchaeologists has said it's just normal, like it's not alluvial, it's not being formed by water or anything. It's more colluvial material that's come in, so it's been just come down from the slopes. I think so. Unfortunately, I'm not really able to help Jo with her interpretation of it. Um, There we go, take the newt off, that'll be easier. I'm just looking at some of the more questions as they're coming in uh, and just trying to bring them together into uh, a question to go back. And I'm going to fire this one back to Joe, if, if that's okay. And it's a little bit about uh, a break in the continuity of the settlement between the late Iron Age and the early Romano British periods. Um, and that's a question from Graham Barton. Thanks, Graham. Uh, uh, and whether we're actually seeing a, a more shift and adoption of the Romanized culture or whether we are seeing a, a break. Um, I think it tends to be, I think it is continuation that we're seeing. Um, and certainly when you, you have a look at the cremation burials, the late Iron Age, early Roman cremation burials, compared to the early Roman ones, um, there is a continuation. And also one of the early Roman cremation burials contained hobnails. So we know, and also we found evidence for the, the Roman style shoes in one of the later inhumations. So there is there is that um, adoption of sort of um, Romanized Roman culture, um, but we haven't we haven't identified a, a break in the late Iron Age um, period activity. Certainly not on site one, site site three. Um, the late Iron Age was was pretty vague. There wasn't much going on. So there's maybe a, a slight break between the Middle Iron Age and and when the Roman Roman activity started up. Thank you. And, and, and as you did touch upon, obviously, some of the more interesting discoveries there, which were our burials and inhumations, I'll just bring Sharon in. That's okay, in chat. Um, and uh, we've got a question from, from Charlie, which you might have spotted, which was, uh, did we know anything about the people that were buried? Um, and whether we had uh, could tell anything from the artefacts or the burials themselves about whether they were particularly important? Yes, um, I'm Sharon. I'm the human osteologist for Cotswold Archaeology um, and examined all the remains for this site. 
Um, yeah, we did find some quite interesting things for the inhumed people. Obviously, there's not an awful lot I can say about individuals who've been cremated, um, apart from, you know, they can be adults or some of them um, were children. Um, so some of the adults showed a lot of signs of wear and tear. They were obviously quite hard lives. There was a crush injury in one of the vertebrae. There was a, an injury to an ankle. Um, so they, they're obviously doing quite hard physical jobs that, that, that leave them prone to, um, exposed to um, these kinds of injuries. Uh, and, you know, given the association with the, the crop driver, I sort of assume that they're doing these agricultural type activities, um, which is having a, a result on their bodies uh, from years of doing this kind of labour. Thank you. Um We've got, got a couple of questions that are a little bit about the, the type of the project, and I'm going to fire a question back to Ed, if that's the word. Um, and um, oh, maybe Philippa might want to join in that one as well. One of the questions from, from Jake was, does taking such a narrow slice through an archaeological landscape have any drawbacks or advantages? Um, I guess the simplest way to describe that is the kind of different projects that we work on as archaeologists. Um, we might be working on an extension of a small town that somebody wants to build 50 new houses. Now, when you have such a very small window, that really does give a tantalizing and not very useful perspective on what might be a wider landscape. So you get these little keyhole uh, pieces of information and it's quite hard to interpret and understand what you have found in those small areas in the wider landscape. It may well be that you're then trying to piece it together with a piece of evidence from 100 meters down the road that was excavated in the 1960s. And that's quite challenging. These linear schemes, such as new railway lines like HS2 or highway schemes such as this one, it might be quite a narrow slice, but what it does is it passes through quite a diverse landscape and it actually gives us a far better understanding of the way in which people were living, the way they were burying the dead and the way they were using this landscape. Um, and I've been working at this game for 20 plus years and actually some of the more interesting stories that come out about the way in which we were using this landscape 2000 years ago 3000 4000 5000 years ago actually comes from these linear projects so I'd, often, I'd say that projects like this are the best kind of projects we can work on as archaeologists because they give us much more of a better picture and a perspective of our discoveries um, one of the other questions was from Anna which was was the volume of finds in line what you expected or did it surpass and disappoint. And if I could chuck that over to Ed or Philippa, please. Thank you. Um, from a pottery perspective, I'm Ed, I'm, I work on the pottery from the site. Um, I think we were a little disappointed that we didn't have more, more evidence for um, kilns on site. And we're very close to some very important um, kiln sites, as we've mentioned. Um, so yeah, that was a little disappointing that we didn't have uh, direct evidence for pottery production on site, or very little of it. Um, in terms of volume, uh, for for what is quite a narrow strip of of um, excavation, I you know ten thousand odd churches is is quite a, a major assemblage for the area. So there's an awful lot that we can do with that material. And unsurprisingly, I mean, although there was no evidence for pottery production on site. Um, a good half of that pottery was clearly made in the area. Um, you know, it's, it's Haddam wares, so very typical of the area. Hi, I'm Philippa and I was the Roman, fine, the Roman coinage specialist on the project. Um, and in terms of the coin assemblage, uh, you find at late Roman rural settlements um, that you get do get, you tend to get some late third and fourth century coins, not a lot, maybe. 10, 15, 20 at, at average numbers. What's really interesting about this site is the number of coins that are coming out of that hollow and that they're concentrated in one area and the date range of the coins is so narrow and that it's AD 330 to 348. So there's something un slightly unusual going on there. Um, yeah, 70 coins overall from a Roman rural settlement is a reasonably substantial assemblage. So it's... It's quite interesting, I think. Thank you, Bo. 
Um, I'm wondering if I can just merge a couple of questions that have come in and fire it back to Joe again, if that's okay. It's a little bit about the way in which the settlement might have fitted into the wider landscape, in particular in relation to the Roman road. Yes, which I forgot to mention about <laughs> the, 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 um, the current course of the A120 um, sort of, um, we think, marks the line of the Roman road, more or less. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, um, we have one corn dryer, um, possibly two, but maybe um, not enough evidence to suggest that they were producing um, more than is needed for a household. So although there's, <laughs> they were, <laughs> <Sarah said. laughs> so being close to the road means that they have a perfect um, distribution network for, for all sorts and obviously for the, the pottery kilns nearby. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that we have a, the big farmstead um, just to the north of the road. And I believe quite a lot of um, Roman archaeology appearing in Stortford, uh, Stortford, Bishop Stortford as well. Yeah, and I guess when I mentioned earlier about that slice through the landscape, <laughs> giving a, a useful perspective of uh, archaeological context of some of the features we find. So you're, you're not just looking at a cemetery, but you've got a bit of the wider agricultural landscape the processing that we just alluded to as well. Um, you still don't know what's just on the other side of where you're excavating. Um, Ed mentioned about the, the amount of pottery we found on site. You know, um, there were a couple of other small artifacts, and I, I don't know if any of my colleagues are really to correct me on this, but I know we did find some window glass, um, some Roman window glass, which doesn't travel very far. Uh, Joe, it, that was right, it was Roman window glass, wasn't it? It was just a small fragment. Um, so it does suggest that there might be some slightly higher status dwellings and some larger dwellings uh, associated with the settlement just beyond the area we were looking at, again, in close proximity to the road. Um, I, I remember from about 15 years ago when somebody said to me, why don't you find any of these really nice high class dwellings really next to the major roads? And I'm like, well, they are, but nobody wanted to build their house right on the M11 2000 years ago. They wanted to build it just a little bit further away, which is why tentatively it might have been just outside the area we were looking at. Um, we had a, a, another question come in for you, if that's all right, Sharon, um, about the health of the burials that we, uh, the health of the individuals that we found in some of the burials. Uh, uh, yeah, well, as I said before, there were a few um, injuries. Um, what was also possible to look at were their teeth. And teeth can tell us a lot about um, the health of an individual, it obviously, and also can give some sort of indication as to diet. Um, and so some one of the individuals had particularly worn teeth. Uh, there, a lot of them were missing, which they'd been lost during the lifetime. Um, so they were obviously um, eating quite uh, sort of carbohydrate rich foods. There wasn't sugar in this period, so they're obviously not eating a lot of sweets or anything, but carbohydrates can have a very similar effect. Um, and the teeth were being worn down from grit in the foods. Um, so there we have a lot of sort of pathology from that point of view. Um, we also had um, the one who was in the ditch was actually a female. Um, she had that arm sort of slightly above her head. I think there was an image of it during Joe's talk. Um, she would look like she'd lived to a good old age. Um, and she also had um, an ankle injury, which was interesting because it's very similar to one of the other individuals, but um, time-wise they were quite a long way apart and it suggests again that they're doing quite similar activities over a long period of time um, so you know we've just got sort of general old age ailments as well that you get again from just re repeated um, activity in the spine things like osteophytes and things um, so they were though there weren't very many inhumations they did give us quite a lot of information um, so hopefully that answers the question yeah, I wonder if I can then turn it into a bit of a question back to you, Sharon, about the, the, the alignment of the burials, because um, uh, one of our uh, attendees has asked a question about religious practice. So in the loosest sense of the word, sometimes we can tell from the way in which the burials have been put together about the religions, can't we? Yes, we can. And we know what's quite typical for the Roman period, which is to be laid on, on your back, which we call um, supine, um, and generally laid out, what we we'll call extended, um, and all the burials, I say, apart from the, the female, were sort of in generally in these positions. 
Um, so it's quite typical for the time period. Um, I'd say the female is slightly unusual with the, with the arm above the head and also placed in the, the top of the ditch there. So I'm not quite sure if there's something slightly different going on with her. Um, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, very typical sort of Roman inhumation burials um, enclosed with, um, within these ditches. Um, we don't quite know in particular what Romans were doing with their religious practices. I think they were quite varied, but we do tend to see these patterns um, across the country. Um, they're all doing quite similar things. Uh, now, I've, I've, uh, I, I'm going to just merge a couple of the questions that have come in again um, in, in for, for Joe and Ed, and it's the, um, the greatest question you ever get asked when you're talking about a settlement that has Iron Age and Roman period remains. Where are the Saxons? <laughs> Do you want to take that one in first? Sorry. Do you want to take that regarding um, whether we had any uh, well, pottery assemblages related to the early medieval period? Um, no, I don't think we did. Um, there was certainly no, that I remember, classically Anglo-Saxon feature types, no sunken featured buildings or anything like that. Uh, the earliest post-Roman pottery we had was, I think, from one of the watching brief areas, which was firmly medieval. Um, although I think that have there not been some radiocarbon dates of the late Saxon period, so there is a little bit going on, but not much artifactually, which which you quite often get. I mean, it's not particularly artifact artifact rich period, but sort of certainly the early early to middle Saxon period. Yeah, we had one, sorry, we have one isolated pit um, on site two, which uh, returned a, a, a sac, um, early to middle Saxon radiocarbon date. And that's it. That was just to the north of Haddon Hall. So maybe there's um, you know, more of a focus further to the south, but nothing, nothing in the Roman settlements like we usually get. Having a look more at some of the questions that have come in, I think we picked up on most of them. So I'm wondering then if um, I could just come back to a couple of the points that were picked up in in, in your in the presentation, Joe, and actually fired my own questions over to Philip Brunet again. Actually, if that's okay. Um, and it's um, just about the rarity of some of the, the 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 pottery and some of the coins we found. So Joe mentioned a, a couple of rare coins and. And I think Ed, you and I might have spoke about this before, but I really like the the, the stamp on the, the Samian ware. Um, it, how, mm. how common is it to find, um, you know, those quality stamps? And um, you know, do we know anything more about this Potter, Patrice? Um, uh, well, I think Joe um, summarised it quite well. We we know that he's a, a South Gaulish Potter. Um, I think, I mean, there are a large number of his. Um, I, I say his, presume it's a, a him. There are a large number of uh, recorded instances of that stamp, um, perhaps a couple of hundred across the empire. Um, it's not un particularly unusual to find Samian on on most most Roman sites. Um, it, I mean, everybody thinks of Samian as very high high status, high quality. It is high quality, but it is also mass produced, so you do get it an awful lot, even on small settlements such as this. Um, I think that particular vessel, there was a possibility that it might have been, uh, I think it was unstratified. We don't, it doesn't have a context, but it was po it's possible certainly that it's been disturbed from a burial. I know a couple of the other cremation burials did include same in vessels, quite fragmented, but they were certainly there. Uh, and there is some indication from other sites that uh, same in another other high uh, high quality pottery was bought particularly for de depositing in burials at that period in the in the sort of middle and later first century. So it's it's not altogether that unusual, certainly. Thank you, Philip. Was there anything you wanted to add on on some of the rare records? Okay, so um. Collection? Yeah, Joe mentioned two quite rare coins in the assemblage, and um, that one was a uh, issue, a uh, Turner Pietas issue of Constantine, one deified, and the other one 
was a house of Constantine Numus from Constantinople. So both of those coins are quite rare in a Romano-British context. I think maybe two or three of each type have been recorded by the Portable Antiquity Scheme nationally. So it shows that they're not coins that commonly turn up in Roman Britain. Um, why they're turning up in the hollow, I, I, I can only speculate. Perhaps, perhaps they're particularly um, they're noted as being particularly rare and unusual reverses. But again, that's speculation. The one from um, coins from Arles, which is one of one of the the one of the coins comes from Arles Mint. They're relatively common, but this reverse type is not common in Britain. Coins from Constantinople are much rarer in Britain more generally. So. Again, I can only speculate about why they're turning up in Hertfordshire at this little site. Thank you. A, a couple of the questions about some of the finds we've been talking about and, and some of the discoveries were, uh, have you got any more photos, any more images of them? Um, I've just posted the link into the chat box to our, uh, the web pages we created, especially for this project, which went live a couple of months ago. And there's a nice gallery of all the finds and more details on some of the things we've been talking about today. Uh, I'll also post a link in there in a moment uh, about the actual project itself, the wider uh, um, flood alleviation and bypass scheme. Uh, so you can look at the details on that wider project too. Um, there was a couple of other questions just about whether the, the work is still ongoing. Um, so we, we're not in the field anymore. Um, as Joe alluded to at the beginning, we were on site for nearly 12 months um, from the summer of 2019 until um, spring, summer of 2020. Um, and um, but we're still working, as Joe has alluded to, on, on, on the post-excavation process. We're still doing assessments and analysis of, of the finds uh, to pull it all together into a final publication. Um, and that will be released and we'll be able to update the web pages that I've just dropped the link to to uh, refine some of, the, some of the things we've been talking about today. Um, we have another question. I think, Joe, you might be able to pick up on this one, which was about the corn dryer and about the material that was used to create it. Yeah, the walls were, were constructed with limestone, from what I can remember. Um, but that's the only material we have. So as I say, we don't know anything about um, what, the, what the enclosing, if there was an enclosing structure, what it would have been made from, but um, potentially a wattle and daub or something like that. So we only had the, you know, so the lower, the base of the wall remaining. That's right. And earlier when I spoke about the way in which the plough um, can cause much damage to buried archaeological remains, it's actually because of the tightly packed, very compressed nature of the foundations of that um, feature that allowed it to survive the way it did. And also mm -hmm. the fact that parts of the wall itself had also collapsed in on the structure, creating an almost uh, uh, single square area of compact material that in, in effect preserved everything below it as well. And it's mm -hmm. because of that particularly heavy, dense material that we had the state of preservation that we had. Um, we also have a question, can any of the artifacts or finds be viewed by the public? Well, yes, um, because um, Joe and uh, my colleague Kaz is going to be, um, in fact, Joe, I'm going to pass over to you to, <laughs> to answer that question as, as you're going to be uh, uh, in attendance in a couple of weeks' time at one of the events. Yes, and I don't know many details yet, I'm afraid. But um, yeah, I think the 11th of December, um, po possibly, I, I, I wouldn't like to guess it, <laughs> whether it's on all day or just the lunchtime. With, with any, yes, it, 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 runs, yeah, it runs from uh, late morning into uh, mid-afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, there's an event uh, at, a, at the uh, local um, church hall. Um, where there'll be uh, presentations and a chance to talk to people involved in the project, um, not just the archaeology, the wider project in general, actually. Um, and what I do is I recommend that you have a look at our um, social media and our web pages, uh, and we'll put out uh, a notification on there so you can come down and speak to Joe and Kaz and have a look at some of the artifacts. <laughs> I'm just um, looking at a couple more questions before starting to wrap everything up. Um, We had um, a 
question about some of the technology we might have used on site and did you use any 3D recording methods during the work and do you have them to view anywhere? Um, yes, we did. Um, uh, particularly with the corn dryer, actually, uh, we were able to use um, some photogrammetry recording, so multiple photos of the site, which we were able to stitch together into a 3D model, um, which you can view on the link I've just posted in the chat box. Um, because there's a small video there as well. There's a link to a video from my colleague, Marta, who's one of our uh, geometricians, and she put together that and she describes how it's built. And, and you can actually go onto the link for the 3D model and zoom and move it all around. It's a wonderful little bit of technology and it really helps and aids the interpretation and understanding of how that feature worked. Um, I've also got another question on the... Um, uh, a non-technical summary or publication about the results that would appeal to local or young people. Um, I would recommend going to, to our web pages because um, uh, hopefully that material is presented in a way that would be useful and, and, uh, and understandable for people who are maybe less involved in and understanding archaeology and are just um, picking it up now, maybe some students or, or, or younger kids too because um, that gives a good explanation of exactly how and why we were in the field, why we were doing what we were doing, and that gives a bit more extra background to it too. Um, we did just have, um, oh, I can see, we've got an answer to one of the questions as well. Um, will a recording of this talk be available later on? Yes, this has been recorded, as I alluded to earlier, um, and um, we're hoping to uh, in the next probably couple of days or couple of weeks, uh, pop it up on our YouTube channel um, and we'll be linking it to the uh, web pages that I've just mentioned as well. Thank you, Joe. Philip. Thank you, Philip. Philip has just um, um, popped in the chat box there and corrected me when I said there's lots of lovely photos of the coins on the web page. There's not lots of lovely coins on the web page. There's a few photos of some lovely coins on the web page uh, because a lot of the coins are badly corroded and actually you can't really make much of them. Thanks, Philip. Cheers. Um, so it's just come up to quarter past eight, uh, which is good timing. And I'm just wondering if anybody on the panel wanted to just um, mention anything else that's come up in our discussions. Um, no, nope, I can't see anybody waving their hands at me. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, to Joe. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much to Philippa, Sarah, Sharon and Ed. I said my thank yous at the beginning to the wider project team that were involved from Hearts Council, from Graham, and anybody else involved in the wider construction project. Um, this isn't the end. Remember, do have a look at that link that I posted on the chat box so you can pick up on um, any updates to the discoveries and the stories that we've been talking to you about today. Thank you very much and good evening. <laughs>